This show is sponsored by Dan Tan Insurance Services, helping businesses get the right insurance for all their insurance needs. Visit denten.io to get a quote. D E N T E N.io. And remember, when you buy an insurance policy from Denten, you're giving back on a global scale. Hello, all my entrepreneurs and business leaders, and welcome to the Michael Esposito Show, where I interview titans of industry in order to inform, educate, and inspire you to be great. My guest today has been in sales for over 40 years with experience in sales management and sales training. He's traveled internationally to speak to thousands of students on sales, business development, and how to live a designed life, helping them to discover and realize their full passion and potential. To him, selling is a true craft, a philosophy, one of which he is truly passionate. He is the CEO of Kingdom Sales Academy. Please welcome Kelly Shaw. Welcome. Hey, good morning, Michael, and happy, 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 happy Veterans Day, by the way. Yes, today is Veterans Day. Um, uh, these these podcasts don't air live, um, but that's all good. We do want to give a shout out to all of our veterans out there um, who are listening to the show. Um, my father is a veteran, served in the Army, served in Vietnam War, and uh, has two Purple Hearts and was a Green Beret and a medic, so I'm very proud of him. Uh, how about you, Kelly? Any any um, ties at, at this day and age? Right, we everybody has a tie to a uh, a veteran. Yeah, so I guess it started with my grandfather. My grandfather was actually uh, awarded the King George Cross, which is the second highest medal you can get in England during World War II. Wow. Um, he also won um, the Italian Star, and anyway, he was one of the more decorated war heroes of uh, World War II. Um, was captured in North Africa by the Nazis and escaped. Uh, saved a couple people. Uh, and then was in bomb demolition in London during um, when the Nazis were bombing London. Uh, fought at the Battle of Anzio, and my uh, stepfather was a 30-year Army Army Air Corps Air Force vet. Um, actually flew a B-17 squadron in World War II. And uh, I, at the young age of 17, uh, thought it was a really good idea to join the Marine Corps. So in 1970... Um, with my mother's permission, I had to drag her down to the recruit uh, recruiting office because I was a minor. And at 17 years old, I said, uh, "This is what I want to do." And uh, that was Vietnam. Didn't uh, didn't get to fight in country, thank goodness. Um, but yeah, I served and uh, come from a big family of being in the military. Uh, never thought about doing anything else the whole time I was in high school, other than well, I thought about being a professional soccer player, but. Uh, Clearly wasn't good enough, but anyway, I got into sales. Here I am you got into sales after that. Well, I, I gotta I gotta stay here for a second with you because you your your story is similar to my dad's. My dad was 1969, and uh, he also was 17 years old and had to drag his mother oh. down to sign off on his paperwork. Oh. Oh, gee, that's funny, man. That is so funny. Yeah, yeah. So, where did you um, where did you do uh, basic? I know he did it in in the south somewhere in like Louisiana. Yeah, or your dad was army, right? So he probably did like you know, yeah, somewhere down south. Um, I did mine at Camp Pendleton. So I got to fly from Spokane, Washington, down to sunny Southern California, and. Uh, uh, spent most of my time there. There was called 29 Stump, which was 29 Palms, um, out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but yeah, it was all it was all pretty much uh, Southern California at that time. The Nixon signed the order to pull the Marines out of Vietnam, so I, I kind of got stuck in a training regiment where I was like a troop leader, an ITR, which was kind of a. <clears throat> at that point, when you went to boot camp, and then you went to what's called ITR infantry training. Then you went to your MOS specialty school. And so I was a troop leader at ITR, and then we phased that out in 72, 73, and then I got out because there was nothing for me to do. Wow. Well, so then you got out, and um, what was what was next for you? I mean, so you're a young guy, and uh, you're a troop leader. Um, you're, you're, a, you're essentially a leader, right, in the Army, or excuse right. me, excuse me, in the Marine Corps. Uh, yeah, I, I, I saw you <laughs> wink at me. I, I saw that smirk. I know. My father, actually, I, I called him this morning, 
uh, to wish him a happy Veterans Day. And he said, he, he, so he's Army. He was out with a, a buddy of his who's, who's Navy. So I said, so who's buying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man! Uh, but yeah, so yeah. Uh, so when you got out, what was what was the first um, getting into um, you know back to civilian life? What was that like for you, dude? You want to know the true story? Yeah, the day I came out, I went naturally tried to enlist in the army. Um, I, I didn't really want to get out of the Marine Corps. I didn't know what else to do. You know, the thought of going to college was like daunting. I just like, what, what am I going to do in college, right? Um, and that was a horrible time to. Um, for the, being in the military, because almost everybody despised you at that time. You know, all the, the hippies, you, things were thrown at us. But, but I actually went down to the Army recruiting office, gave them my background, um, signed up to be a warrant officer so I could try to fly helicopters fixed wing. Um, I found out when I was in the Marine Corps, a lot of males are blue-green deficient. <laughs> so I am. <laughs> my wife and I laugh all the time because she'll send me out to buy, buy blue pillows and I'll come home with gray or what I think are gray pillows, and they're actually blue. Um, but I couldn't fly in the Marine Corps because, uh, you know, I, you know, they want you to be able to pick things out of camouflage, you know, not your own positions, and I couldn't do that. So, um, But anyway, I signed up for the Army. There was a glitch with my paperwork. There was a mistake in the Marine Corps where they didn't show me as actually being, you know, out of the Corps yet. So that took about a month to get cleared up, and by that time, um, a bunch of my buddies who had just got back from Vietnam, they were all LERPs, Long Range Reconnaissance of Patrol. Your dad probably knows who they are. Um, a level below the Green Berets, maybe two levels below the Green Berets. And they convinced me just to go to college and stay the heck out of Vietnam. And, you know, warrant officers don't last but about 90 days in Vietnam. And so unless you have a death wish, do not fly helicopters. <laughs> so I, I didn't go back in. I went to college, actually. And... Um, Got involved a little bit in politics and realized that was not my thing and ended up going to work with my stepfather as a carpenter in uh, Port Angeles, Washington, and started building homes. Wow. So, I mean, very extensive background there. So um, in college, what did you study? And and part of like why um, I think this is so important is um, you have such a, a, a career in sales that, that follows all of this stuff that you're, you're mentioning right now. But I always feel like, you know, I've been in sales um, close to 20 years now, and everything that I learned uh, in all those different experiences that I had, um, I've, I've incorporated today. And so I think it's so important to talk about politics. What, what, what was that like? What, what do you mean you had a short stint there? What, what did you do? So when the only thing I ever thought about being other than in the military was actually a history teacher. Um, my two history teachers in high school had a big, and my, and my, um, my chem teacher uh, all had an influence on me. And so when I came out of the Marine Corps and I, and I opted not to go in the Army, I said, well, I'm going to go to college. Uh, I'm going to take poli-sci because I was kind of involved in politics. And I'm, I'm going to get a degree and I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to be a history teacher. Um, yeah. But politics was not fun in those days. There were a lot of uh, retired guys from the military going to school on the GI Bill just so they can get money to go to school, right? And then there was like a bunch of young people my age that were like hippies. And all we did all day long was fight about the Vietnam War, you know, in class. And I was involved with a politician in Washington State that in those days, in the preliminaries, you could actually vote across, you know, party lines. And so we had a lot of, quote, in those days, you know, when you're young and stupid, you're an incredible liberal, right? I was incredibly liberal. Um, and so I was looking for a Democrat. And a lot of the Republicans uh, crossed over to vote for our opposing candidate, which he won. But fortunately, uh, he was running for state senator or, yeah, state senator or uh, U.S. Senate. And the guy who beat him was a guy named Dan Evans, who ended up being probably the best governor Washington State had. He was a Republican. Um, and I ended up you know, eventually kind of drifting over to a different party. But um, it, after about six, maybe not even six months of college, maybe four months of college, I just said, man, this whole political, all we do is argue all day long. Is this what politics is all about? And then I, I remember, which I think differently now, I just remember like, you know, politics is kind of like religion. If you believe X, you you can't drift over to Y. I mean, if X is your belief, like Christianity, let's say, um, 
you can't compromise and say, yeah, okay, well, maybe I should take a little bit of Hinduism, a little bit of Buddhism, a little bit of this, and we'll incorporate that in our religion. That way everybody's happy. It's like it doesn't work that way. So and I just got really fed up, and I said, okay, I'm going to go to work for my dad, building homes, something that I can actually be proud of at the end of the day that hopefully is still standing, you know, these many years later, I would hope. Um, so I did that for actually a couple of years. Yeah. Um, and really loved it. I mean, we built custom homes. We built um, John Nordstrom's home uh, back in the day uh, on Lake Washington. We built, you know, back in the early 70s, we were doing quarter million, half million dollar custom homes. So pretty, pretty expansive, pretty large, really fun to build, really intricate. I mean, you had to kind of almost have a degree in, in uh mathematics to figure out how to put some of these, you know, homes together and, and to cut the, in those cases, we were using huge, big timbers to build these 20 foot A frames, climbing up ladders with, you know, these huge massive logs trying to put them up. It was, it was fun and incredibly scary at the same time. <laughs> you don't strike me as somebody who's uh, afraid of much though. Um, uh, uh, w- one quick thing, uh, another, it- it's just wild to, to see the commonalities, but my father actually was a history teacher before he became a PA in, in his civilian life. Oh, really? <laughs> we, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to have to connect the two of you somehow or another. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm interested in, in what you gained from those experiences, uh, and, and what you were able to, how you were able to translate that into some of the stuff that you've done in your sales career. I, I tell you the things that I think I took. Number one is I was very fortunate to be raised in a military family. And unfortunately, when you're, when you're in a military family and your dad's a lifer, you move every three years, right? Mm. I mean, so you could be in the middle of the school year and it could be the middle of the semester and your dad's up and moving to a new country at a new Air Force base somewhere else. Mm. So it was kind of traumatic at the time, but I learned to adapt. I learned to not fear change. Um, so that was probably really important. The other thing I loved about being in a military family was the diversity because um, you know, we were kind of sheltered. We, we lived on base quite a bit, but you know, so there would be black families, black and white families. There were a lot of mixed families, Asian, a lot of military guys, particularly Air Forces. I was around the Air Force. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of Japanese wives, a lot of Filipino wives, a lot of Vietnamese wives, right? I mean, so it was really fun and interesting to be around a bunch of different cultures and how they act and how they treat each other. I think that was a Probably at the time, I don't think I really appreciated it. But I think later on in life, I think it served me really well. So, like, right now, I'm I'm not afraid to get up and move. Um, I went to Europe for six months a few years back, and I spent a month in a different country. Um, In fact, that's where I proposed to my wife in Prague, the Czech Republic. Um, Because I read Tim Ferriss's book, and I went, that. so we'll get into my story later, but I went, that's the life I want. I'm going to design that life. I want to travel. I want to make money. I want to do what I love to do. And, you know, at, at that time I was 65. So I said, so, you know, hey, it's not too late to start. I'm going to go and I'm going to stop doing financial services, which I was one of the top insurance agents in the country. And I'm going to go do what I love, which is speaking and training and training salespeople. And um, I just jumped in with both feet. So I well, why, why wait till later to talk about it? Um, so you said you read Tim Ferriss's book, I'm assuming, The 4-Hour Workweek? Yes. Yeah, so tell us about that. Tell us about that experience with The 4-Hour Workweek. So I, I don't know who turned me on to that book. I wish I could remember, but somebody did. and Or it just came across, you know, call it serendipity, call it God speaking to you, but I, I bought the book. And I hadn't read a book cover to cover in, I don't know. I mean, I'm a real big skimmer. I skim a lot of stuff, and I, I it kind of go through. But I hadn't finished the book in a long time. And I got that book, and I sat down with it, and it, was, it just kind of blew me away. And I went, I don't know if this is really true, but it's possible. And if it's possible, then why can't I make it happen for me? Hmm. So... I went through the whole thing about being a um, 
kind of non-location specific, uh, I said, well, I don't know if I can run my financial services company from being, you know, in foreign countries, but I could come back once a quarter, have quarterly reviews with my clients, and I could do everything else via, at that point, just cell phone, right? Zoom wasn't a big thing. The pandemic hadn't hit yet. I was familiar with Zoom and some of those other things, but I just decided actually it was it was actually New Year's Eve. I want to say it was 20, 2018. Hmm. Yeah, I think it was 2018. Um, all my friends were going out partying, having a good time, and I was like sitting at home. I was having my own party. It was a pity party. And even though I had made a lot of money, I had a lot of toys, I had a really beautiful home, I was just like, man, this, something's missing. Um, you know, I wasn't in a relationship. I, I, I hadn't been close with God in a long time. And that night, um, I started off with one bottle of, of wine. It may have been good. It may have been bad. I don't know. But after my second bottle of wine, I ended up going to sleep, and I, and I had a dream that night. And in that dream, I was actually standing at the pearly gates waiting for God to let me in. And the gates opened, and he came out, and he looked at me, and he said, Kelly, I'm so disappointed. I gave you so much potential. And when I woke up that morning, I went, oh, crap. I got to design a new life. And then that whole Tim Ferriss book, like, kind of just hit me. And it's like, what do I really want to do? What am I unhappy with in my, in my life? Do I really need this much money? Because I was, I was a sales beast, and I hate to use that term. But, I mean, I could close deals, right? And sometimes I close deals just for the money. And it didn't always feel right, but I knew it was the right thing for the client. Um, but... I, so I sat down, I spent about a solid week just kind of figuring out what kind of life do I really want. Now, unbeknownst to me at that time, I was coming down with diabetes. Even though I'm in really good shape, I had like, I don't know, 17, 18% body fat. We worked out every day, um, didn't eat bad food. Uh, just, I don't know what happened. Man. Just boom, something happened one day. I got diabetes. I, almost, I had like 750 blood sugar, which I probably should have been in a coma. Um, and... <clears throat> I just said, okay, here's what I want to do. I'm going to sell my house. I'm going to travel. I'm going to figure out a way to make money from my laptop and my cell phone, period. I made sure I had a good cell phone carrier that would translate overseas. Um, I was still trying to figure out the whole thing about the uh, VPNs, and, and I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I, but I found a company that would say, okay, travel with us for 12 months. Every month we're going to go to a new country. We'll put you up. We'll give you a roommate. We'll give you a co-workspace, and then you just got to do your thing. And so I said, sounds good to me. I'm 60. And they go, um, so here's all the countries we're going to. Which of those countries do you not want to go to? And I said, well, every one of them. They go, well, why do you want to come then? I go, because I don't want to go to any one of those countries, right? So that makes me believe I should go to those countries. I need to have new experiences. You know, I've got probably 30, 40 years left on this planet. It's maybe time for me to start experiencing other cultures without staying at the Ritz Carlton or, you know, the JW Marriott. I want to see how other people of the world live. And so I said, sign me up. I'm on board. I'll figure it out. Let's go. Mm. And that's what I did. So it was, uh, it was, it was very interesting. I, I loved it. I spent time in Croatia for a month. It was a great country. Um, the Czech Republic, I love Prague. I got, I flew my, uh, at the time, I just met a gal before I left. I flew over for her birthday and proposed to her, uh, which is a heck of a story. Uh, by the way, if, if, I don't know if you're married or whatever, but if you decide to propose to anybody, anybody who's listening to this, do not give the wedding ring or the engagement ring to a restaurateur to surprise your potential future wife with the idea they're going to bake it inside of a really cool dessert. So that when they open the dessert, it's going to, yeah, it doesn't ever work out that way. And mine didn't. It was like a horror story, but it was very funny. Um, she finally found the ring in her dessert and she said yes. And so we ended up getting married. So I cut my 18 month trip down to five months and then came back and we've um, been building her real estate empire ever since. So. She's building her real estate empire, you said? Well, yeah, I. So she's actually in real estate, and when we got married, I said, hey, look, I'm doing my financial services thing. I'm trying to get out of it. I'm just, you know, I've been doing it for 20-some years. I'm bored. I want to get back into sales training. I want to, like, build something new and different, and that's just the kind of guy I've always been. 
And uh, she goes, oh, well, come join real estate with me. And I go, you're kidding me, right? I go, real estate salespeople are the worst freaking salespeople I've ever met in my whole life. Like, they're horrible. Like, they don't even know how to sell. I couldn't possibly be a realtor. And then she explained, <clears throat> she was moving over to this new company called EXP, and they have kind of a, I don't want to call it multi-level marketing kind of, you know, pay plan. But if you recruit agents or you recommend people to EXP, you get paid like seven layers deep, right? And I went, oh, that's a pretty cool business model. And they were virtual. They have no offices. And I went, oh, that's really cool. You know, so they're really on the leading edge of technology. So I said, <clears throat> let me take over your sales team. I'll turn you into one of the top agents in the world. Just give me three years, right? And within two years, uh, she's in the top 2% of all agents in the world. And at least in EXP, there's 90,000 agents, and she's what's called a triple icon winner. Um, so I help run the sales team. I take a lot of the sales calls. I help close all the deals. And I've trained her and, and a couple of other what we call showing agents. And we do, we, up until two months ago, we did pretty massive amounts of business. We did 150 units last year. Wow. which is like unheard of so, you know, for us, like a really a one person shop. So has your perception of uh, real estate agents changed now? <laughs> <laughs> so I will tell you my perception of all salespeople is the same. I don't care if they're in real estate or if they're in car sales or if they're in whatever sales. <clears throat> Most of them are amateurs and they don't do what it takes to be a professional. Um, so it. So my opinion is the same, I think, across the board, okay. which is why I love to serve that, that group so much, because there's only that much difference between being good and being great, right? Mm -hmm. So why not strive to be great? Um, spend a little bit more time learning your craft. I'll tell you why. I well, When I was selling my house, getting ready to leave on this trip around the world, I had uh, purchased a house, <clears throat> remodeled it, made it really cool, very high tech, wasn't going to appeal to a lot of people. It was pretty phenomenal. It was in a town called Temecula, California, on a hill with a beautiful view all the way down towards San Diego, all the way up. You could see the fog of the coast. You couldn't see the coast. but So I actually had doorbell cameras and cameras in my house because I had one of my daughters staying with me for a while, and so I wanted to make sure that everything was cool. And I would always surprise my daughter if she was watching TV because I could talk from the camera. You know, so I would, like, scare her sometimes because I just love to scare my kids. That's what parents do, right? And so I, I listed the house, and this is what I, this is what I saw over a four-day period of time. The agent would come to the door, ring the doorbell, go to the lockbox, and then they'd sit there and look at their watch waiting for their client to show up. Half the time, it was the very first time they ever met their client. They would come in the house, and they would say, this is the kitchen. Like, this is the kitchen? Like the refrigerator, the stove, the dishwasher, and the sink in the middle of a 10-foot beautiful white, you know, waterfall island doesn't give you a clue it's the kitchen. Then they'd say, go ahead and walk around the house, come back and tell me what you think. Now, I'm going, that is not the way I would handle this deal. I would get there early. I would preview the home. I would call the homeowner and say, hey, tell me some things about your home that are cool, unique, different, this and that. So I called my agent up and I go, nobody is showing this home without me being there. Nobody. So this went on for about a week and a half. And so I, I ended up calling my agent. I said, from this point forward, only me, only me. So the next person that showed up, I brought him in the house. I explained how I custom designed the tile, where the tile came from in the entryway, I explained my music room, <clears throat> and I brought it in the kitchen. I went, <clears throat> do you guys hear that? And they go, hear what? I go, you guys don't hear that noise? They go, no, what noise? I go, that's the dishwasher and the garbage disposal that are both on, and you can't hear them. See, I bought the most expensive, quietest dishwasher and garbage disposal. Why? Because if somebody's in here doing dishes, and grinding stuff in the garbage disposal, you could still watch TV and hear it. So I actually talked about the features of the house, the benefits to the client, and the advantage to them, right? So FAP, feature advantage and benefit. So I sold the house. I went and talked about all the stuff. I took them upstairs. I showed them the room. I showed them the custom closet kits, how easy it is to reconfigure them. 
Um, I talked about the balcony and the views and the 4th of July fireworks, and you can see the ones from Temecula, ones from Lake Elsinore, ones from San Diego. And by the time I got done, that person bought the house, and they paid me all the money. That's incredible. But I was the only salesperson, the only salesperson that actually sold the house. (laughs) Everybody else was, take a look. Tell me what you think. I can get that at a store. I could go to Kmart. Do they even have Kmarts anymore? I could go to Walmart. I'm dating myself. And I could get somebody to say, can I help you? Let me show you around. Look, pick what you want, bring it back to me, and I'll ring it up at the register. That is not what sales is all about. Hmm. Sales is asking questions, finding a need, if you have the right product, making it easy for that person to buy. Yeah, uh, there's so many salespeople out there who who aren't very familiar with that process, and and uh, your services are certainly needed. It's funny, um, you know, I, I'm in the insurance industry as as I mentioned to you earlier on, um, and in our industry, uh, you know, in New York, um, auto insurance is 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 you must have it right. It's it's part of the legal right. process. And so I think insurance agents kind of just like, you know, the client walking in the house and tour, just go ahead and take a look around the house. It's kind of insurance agents are the same way. It's like, all right, let me quote you on your home and auto. And why? Why should why should I let you quote my auto? And they feel no. like it's um, um, agents feel like it's their it's their right to be able to just say that to someone. And the philosophy that I teach at my company and, and that uh, at Denton and, and the philosophy that my agents use is more of, you know, why are you calling me, right? Why, why are you calling me for a quote? Of all the agents that you could have called for an auto quote, why are you calling me? And, and what kind of relationship do you have with your agent? What kind of relationship are you looking for? You know, these are the questions that we get into. And, and it's funny because, you know, clients are typically thrown off by that, right? Because they're used to the sales. They're used to, well, aren't you going to ask me about my car? Aren't you going to ask me about what I got? It's like, well, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why don't you slow down a yeah. little bit? Let's get to know each other a little bit. Yeah, I was, we had a Zoom call yesterday. And um, one, of the, one of the things I was t- telling my team is like, look, when we start talking to clients, you got to ask tough questions sometimes. You, you can't get into sales mode. It's first you got to find out can you even help them. Right. And, I, and I told them, I go, look, if there's one magic question, there's no such thing as a magic question. But if there's something that close to a magic question, it's, you know, Michael, why now? And why me? Yep. Like something prompted you to call me today, call my agency, and something prompted you to do it today. That's right. And I ask you why. You know, and that's like, to me, that's about as close to a magic bullet as you can get. Like when they open up and start answering that question, now you can start to build a relationship and really start digging deeper into figuring out how you can serve. Um, one of the things that... And, I, and I wait, before, and before well, you even move on from there, and from there, you, you know the real reason why they're yeah. either going to buy or not buy. Right. You know, it's like I tell them, like, okay, so there's a reason they're looking right now. What's, what's that reason? And, and you know, what prompted them this week? What prompted them to look at our ad? And why did they decide to call on that ad? Like, okay. you know, th- there's something there. So when I used to train car salesmen, I, and I ran a couple of dealerships for a while in the mid to late 80s, early 90s, and uh, car salesmen would say, oh, my clients, they're just all looky loose. I go, dude, it's Friday freaking night. Do you think a guy who worked all week came home on a Friday night at the dinner table with his wife and kids? He said, you know, honey, I'm not tired enough. Let's go car shopping. Let's go stroke a car salesman because I think that would be really fun. Right. I'm like, if they're on the dealership, there's something in their head saying, I'm looking for a car. Right. All they got to do is be the salesperson. And, and I would tell them, look, it takes two to three hours to sell a car. Now, you can spend five minutes asking questions and two and a half hours trying to grind them into a car that may or may not work. Or you can get to know the client, find out their last car. When did they buy it? How did they buy it? Did they buy it new? Did they buy it used? 
How many miles a year do you put on the car? When you drive it, do you drive it for personal or pleasure or combination of both? When you drive, do you drive by yourself? Does anybody else drive the car? Do these questions get asked? Almost never. But when you get into that, now you can start painting the picture of maybe the right car and how it's going to benefit the client. And you may not have the right car. And I think it's okay to just say, you know what, hey, I'd love to help you, but I honestly don't have anything right now that I think really suits what you're looking for. But if you don't mind, I'll stay in touch, and if something comes across, can I give you a call? And that's also a great way to ask for referrals, too. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's a you know, Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. No, no, I, I was just going to expand on that. You go ahead. Yeah. So I, I was in insurance, different types. I was in annuity sales and in some life, not a huge life producer. But when people would come to my seminars or workshops and, or, you know, I'd be on stage or whatever, and I realized, look, number one, I'm probably not for everybody. I mean, that's the first thing I've got to understand, number one. Number two, my products and services aren't for everybody. Could they benefit everybody? Yes. but. You know, it's, it's probably not a good fit for everybody. Mm. But there is a really great fit for a huge majority of people. And sometimes people would come into my office, and I would just tell them, I go, you know what, I'm looking at your stuff. To be quite frank, whoever your financial advisor is, doing a pretty damn good job. To be quite frank, I'm not sure I could do a whole lot better. I might be able to. I might not. But I wouldn't say that you should change to me just for whatever because they're doing a good job. Now, I've turned down many deals. Now, some of those I turned down because I didn't want the headache of that client because they were a pill, right? Um, but a lot of times it was just there wasn't enough benefit for the client to make the switch, even though I knew I could probably do a little good job for them. When it really came down to push and shove, I, I was just totally frank and honest with them. Some of those clients actually sent me some of my biggest clients ever because they said, hey, I didn't do business with this guy, but he's the only guy who told me the truth. Yeah. In fact, one of those clients came back to me later on and gave me his money, and he goes, I don't know if you remember, but I was in your office, and I kept asking you all these questions. They go, I remember, because you're one of the very few clients that would ask me those types of questions. He was going, I was testing you to see if you were telling me the truth and if you were being frank and totally honest. And he goes, you were. And so he gave, he gave me his $2 million later on and referred a bunch of people to me. And he would always come to my seminars and stand up and say, hey, I've been doing business with him for years. He's a great guy. He has great parties. He takes care of his clients. You know, when you deal with Kelly, you're not just, you know, a client, your family, your friends. And that helped get me a lot of business over the years. But at first, I had to turn him down and tell him, I don't know that I can help you, dude. Like, you're, you got some pretty good stuff. Yeah, you know, it's you got to plant plant the seed, and and I think, you know, that that's another thing that I'm sure you teach in your sales training um, is is that honesty and 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 realizing that when you're honest, when you do right by people, it's going to come back to you, and sometimes tenfold. Um, I I want to get into a little bit about prospecting because you mentioned seminars and talking on stage. And uh, I, I think that your philosophy on prospecting is probably um, uh, new or different to most of the salespeople that you're actually referring to when you talk about that like spectrum of salespeople who are not professional salespeople in thinking that I got to pound the calls, the, the, the phones or pound the pavement, which I'm sure was part of your strategy. But it sounds like by putting on seminars and doing some of the things you do, you do a little bit more of a unique way of prospecting, which I'd be interested to hear about. Yeah, you know, I... um. There's a whole lot of ways to get clients, right? And in a lot of industries, whether it's financial services, whether, you know, they want you to dial for dollars. That's right. And and, and that works. That's just never been my strong point. Well, right? and, and just so to I, put, a, put, a, put a little note on that for everybody, that works because it's a numbers game. Correct. And, and yeah. you're different because yeah. of that. So I said, look, n- number one, I was trained, so can we backtrack a second, Michael? Yeah, go for it. Let me tell you how I got into sales. I would so love that. A lot that. of people say, oh, yeah, Kelly, you're an acid-born salesperson. 
Oh, good Lord. Nobody's born a natural born salesperson. <laughs> I, I used to do, when I used to do training seminars in the financial services industry, I'd get up on stage and I'd say, hey, how many people here were born speaking English? Like 99% of the room went up. And then I'd say, okay, your hand didn't go up. What were you born speaking? Oh, Swedish or German. I go, no, you weren't. Yeah, you didn't know anything when you were born. You couldn't even say mama or dada. You had to learn it. It was a script. Some of your scripts are really good. Some of your scripts are wrong. But you all have a script for the language you speak. Some of y'all are from New York and have a different dialect than the people from Dallas who sound different than the people from Louisiana or from the dudes that live in California. But you have a script. And I realized that when I was in carpentry, I don't know if something kept drawing me to sales. I had to like, I couldn't talk to people for nothing. Now, when I was in the Marine Corps and a troop leader, I was given that authority because of my position and my skill level at the things I could do. I didn't earn it necessarily. I mean, I, I guess you kind of did, but it, I wasn't like a natural born leader. Those were things I had to learn and develop when I was in the Corps, which are a, a pretty rudimentary discipline thing. Um, when I came out, I, I, I said, I'm going to go into sales. I don't think I can do this carpentry. I was working in Port Angeles, Washington. So between Port Angeles and what's called Nia Bay, for every mile you go further west, it rains one inch more a year. So I'm out in Squim, where they filmed all those vampire movies. You know, it rains 200 inches of rain a year sometimes out there. Not Squim, the other direction, Nia Bay. Um, 200 inches, like every day it rains. So you start work, you can't stop, because when you stop, you can't go back to work because you're soaking wet. So I said, I got to do something different. So I wanted to get into sales. So I applied for a sales job. And I think I applied at like eight jobs. Nobody even called me back. One lady calls me back and said, Kelly, I want to meet with you. And I'm thinking, oh, I got a job. She goes, Kelly, you'll never make it in sales. You'll never make it. She goes, you really don't know how to dress well. You kind of put together, but those, like, you should never have applied at my store wearing those clothes. That's number one. Big lesson learned there. Number two, your nails look like hell. It looks like you bite your nails. You don't take good care of them, which means you don't have self-confidence. And, you know, and she went through a list and just beat me up. But she said, there's something about you. I don't know what it is, so I'm going to give you some advice. If you want to get into sales, number one, Here's some places you might start. Number two, take a Dale Carnegie course on sales. Mm. And take a Dale Carnegie course on public speaking. That was 1977. And um, I took both those courses. And I, even though I was afraid to get up in front of people before then, from that day on, I realized I was made to be in front of people. I loved it. I had to learn to love it. I hated it. I couldn't talk to people. One of the things she told me is I never looked her in the eye when I was talking to her, right? So I'm going, wow. I could either take that as a slap in the face or I could take it as like a challenge like in the, in the core. I'll show you, which I kind of did, but I also heeded her advice and, and started studying sales and studying people and, you know, how to make them feel important and how to draw more info out of them. And that came from very old school Dale Carnegie, Norman Vincent Peale. Uh, these are all kind of Christian-based. And, you know, and they're sales, by the way. The first thing they teach in sales, in every one of those old-school courses, from Ogman Dino to Norman Vincent Peale to Dale Carnegie, is first you got to serve. First you got to serve. First you got to serve. And somehow over the decades, we've lost track of that. I mean, I think we're coming back to that now. I see all these new sales gurus. They're all saying the same thing those guys did 50, 60, 80 years ago, right? So I have to learn something, and it was very hard for me when I first got into it. But once I got into it and I developed the skills, then sales became fun and easy. I could do it in my sleep. In fact, I used to tell a thing in my summer, it's like, you should know your script so good, so well, that your spouse or your partner could wake you up in the middle of the night ask you a question, you should be able to handle it like that and go right back to sleep without missing a link. Mm. It's like in racing cars, if you're doing 150 miles an hour, I don't care if you're going around a round track or if you're going around a Formula One course, 
you don't look at where you're at. You look where you're going, and you don't have, and you don't think because if you think you're dead, mm. you have to react if something happens in front of you doing 150 miles an hour. And when you're in, a, in the middle of a sales call, you're in the middle of a sales presentation. It's like going 150 miles an hour. If you don't have your skills internalized, where you can sit back and look at somebody and notice little things that they do or say, would you bring up a point? If you're always trying to think about what you're going to say, then you're never going to see how it really affects them. You know, one of the techniques I, I learned maybe a year or so ago is when you're doing a Zoom training, never look at yourself. Look at the audience. And then go back and review the video and say, when you made a point, did that engage the audience or did it disengage the audience? And that's the same thing in sales. If you understand your crap, you've internalized it, you've made it your own, you've tweaked it to where it comes so naturally. Then when you're sitting down with a client, you don't always have to have the right answer right on the tip of your tongue. You can sit back and, and look and say, oh, I mean, that's a good question, Michael. Let me think about that for a second. Nobody's brought that up in, in quite a while. And you can be a lot more natural. You can be disarming. Um, but so many people have this one script, which is not them, and all they think about is sale, 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 dollar, 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 and not serving the client properly. Mm. I know I kind of went off on a tangent. It was like, how do we start this conversation? Yeah, no, no, no. Well, 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 I think you brought up some really great points that I'd like to reiterate to our audience, um, which are, you know, you're not you're not born with this innate ability to sell, and anybody who's in sales or and 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 let's just also understand here is that if you're a business owner, if you're an entrepreneur, you're in sales. You might run operations, you might run marketing, you might be creative and do all these other things. But in order for your business to survive, you are selling. And whether you're selling to the client or you're selling to your partners or you're selling to your employees, you're selling something. And to that point, what, what you just said, Kelly, that I think is, I know is the most important piece is learning how to speak, how to communicate. Um, public speaking, and so I, I actually ended up. I, I'm, I'm, I can't think of his name off the top of my head. It's killing me right now. I can see his face, but the little red book of selling, uh, Jeffrey Gittimer. Gitmore, yeah. Jeff Jeffrey Gittimer. Uh, is it Gitmore? I always call him Gitmer. I but I but I'm oh, also. <laughs> I think it is Gittimer, yeah. But Gittimer, I'm also a bad Gittimer, reader. Yeah. Um, uh, he had in one of, I, I forget, it wasn't, I don't know I don't know if it was in the book or if it was on YouTube I was watching or his podcast or whatever it was that I'd listened to with him, but I had followed him for a while when I first started in my sales career. And he had mentioned Toastmasters. And he mentioned it more than once. And eventually I finally joined a Toastmasters group. And it's, it, it's so crazy, Kelly, because it's like what you said about being born to sell. Um, I, I thought I was born to communicate. I thought I was born to be able to act and to be able to, and I record my very first speech. And I look back at that recording. I actually use that recording for, for new uh, newcomers to Toastmasters and people that I train in public speaking. And I share that one with them because it is so bad. You, you know, this is a person who took public speaking, who wants to be on stage, who, you know, that fear of getting on stage wasn't really there. It was maybe some some nerves and all that other stuff. But I was you could tell I was nervous. I was the eye contact wasn't 100 percent there. I was reading a script. I wasn't speaking from my heart, although I wrote the script from my heart. It didn't come across that way. Right. And I got to watch this video back. And, and today I speak much better. I'm, 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 I'm in a place that, you know, I'm, I'm considered a professional speaker at this point, but I'm nowhere near where I want to be. I still have tons of improvement to, to grow from. But what I'm, what I'm getting at is that people see me now and go, well, you just have it. You just know how to speak. And I go, no, I put in time. I put in five years. For the last five years, I meet with my Toastmaster group weekly. Every week we meet. I almost never miss a meeting. And I go to that meeting with either a speech prepared or I'm the Toastmaster orchestrating a meeting or I'm taking a role. And in between all of that, I'm listening to podcasts on public speaking. I'm, I'm going out and I'm learning on different ways to speak. I'm watching speakers. I'm watching TED Talks. I'm observing it, not just for the content, but how are they performing as a speaker. I'm taking notes on it. I'm providing feedback to, to my Toastmasters. So where I'm going with all of this is that all of that work translates into sales. 
Because back to your point, when you're when you're speaking with a prospect or somebody else, you need to know what you're going to say. You need to be on point, and you need to be clear and polished. Because, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pitch this back to you, is if if you're in sales. And whether you know the material, like you said, 150 miles an hour, you know all the material, but you come across as disheveled, right? As like unpolished, saying um every other line, saying like, not really understanding um, how you're coming across to to that person. H- how's that sale going to land? Yeah. You know, and I love what you said a few minutes ago. And there's a quote I wrote down, I wish I had it in front of me right now, but Sales is all about communication. And for me, if the greatest sale you got to make is that first sale to yourself about you, your product, your service, the company you're repping, whatever that is. And, and you, you've got to make that sale to yourself. And then once you're super excited about that, like you, you've got this energy, this excitement, right? Then all selling is is taking that energy that you have and transferring it to the other person. Once they have that same energy, I tell a story. Like, we've all heard the expression, right? You can lead a horse to water, but... You can't you make him drink. Yeah, only an idiot takes a horse that's not thirsty to a watering hole <laughs> tries to make him drink. That's a good one. A good, a good trainer will get on the horse, ride him around the track till it's frothing up the mouth. Now you can't hold him back. You see, and that's what we are. We're the trainers. We're the jockeys. The horse is our client. And if they're not thirsty, they're not going to drink from the watering hole. What you've got to find out is what's their problem? What's their need? They need water. They may not know it yet, but it's going to be 90 degrees and sunny today. They need to drink, right? So how do we make them drink? Get them frothing at the mouth. Mm. Now they're going to go to the water hole, they're going to drink, and they're going to get satiated, and they're going to be able to make it through the day, even though it's going to be hot, and you know they're, they're going to have plenty of water. So that's kind of what we are, like, right? Yep. We're just, we're, we're the medium of it in between the exchanges of energy and excitement about a product or service. And, and I, I love that, that transferring of energy. So, so staying on the horse analogy, how do you, how do you find your horses? Um, so we talked about public speaking and getting on stage. So, yeah, so um, getting back to that, that topic there, because I think that, uh, like I said, our business owners that are, who are out there, our entrepreneurs, our sales executives who are listening right now are interested in how, how okay, you know what, Kelly? I, I, took a, I, I took a public speaking class. Um, I'm feeling good about it. I'm in Toastmasters. I'm, I'm, I got my script. It's a good one. But now I got nobody to tell it to. Yeah, so I can, I can tell you the things we've done, right, whether it's in financial services, whatever. What some of my other friends have done, some of my colleagues have done, and some of my clients have done. And right now... Um, Everybody has a platform, and that platform, fortunately or unfortunately, is social media. Mm. Like, Michael, you're doing a podcast, Mm -hmm. right? I convinced my wife to do a podcast, so she has a podcast um, for women of influence. And we're always searching for women of influence, not necessarily sales, whatever, but just women that have accomplished something, and they're influencing some part of society in some way, shape, or form. We all have some sort of influence on society. So how are you going to get your voice out there? Well, one, you you could go to Instagram and do an Instagram reel, right? You can go to Facebook and do Facebook Live. Heck, I've gone to concerts. I'm a big alt music fan, right? I've gone to concerts and filmed the whole concert live. So all my friends can find out why I'm at a small venue watching this killer band from Iceland. Like, you guys don't like this from the south. They're from Iceland. Listen to this music. You could do that from your home. If you don't, right now, you can see that I'm wearing a black shirt. I hope so you can see. I'm, I don't even know if you can see. I, um, I, I can see you. Our audience cannot. <laughs> cannot. Right. But, but I'm going to so, describe you. What you don't know is, what am I wearing from the waist down? Right. Fortunately, shorts. Fortunately, shorts. That match my outfit because I'm a matchy, matchy kind of guy. Drives my wife crazy. Well, um, but you could get on and sit down in front of a computer like this and just do a five minute speech on something that's relevant that people could get value 
you from? You could go, like, I believe in TV, believe it or not. So we will approach a TV station and say, hey, we, we have this concept, this idea, we have this service we provide. We would love to be on one of your shows. <clears throat> now, we get invited to be on the show, but guess what we have to do most of the time? We got to pay. But you know what? I've got about eight TV segments in the can. And when somebody says, well, explain, explain this to me. How does it work? Well, and let me do this. Let me send you a couple of TV interviews. So, number one, you get to see who you're dealing with, number one. Number two, those interviews are both a little different. But I think if you watch them, they're about three to four minutes. I think you'll get a really good concept of who we are, what we're all about, and what our mission in life is. And then after you watch those, let's set a time to get back together. By the way, I'm going to send them to you on your phone and your email. So just do me a favor. Text me. These are always phone calls. Your name, your email. Put your phone number in there. I'll forward that to one of my assistants. I'll make sure she reaches out and sends everything to your email. But I'm going to send it to your phone right now. In fact, you should already be getting dings on your phone. I just sent them to you. <laughs> and look those over. I sent you a couple of testimonials of people we've done business with in the last six months in your area. Um, check those out. I think they'll give you a good idea of what the process is like and what it's like to work with them. Um, I, I do, so we do a lot of social media. We do a lot of TV. Um, think one thing you talked about, Michael, is Toastmasters, right? Right. Like, I don't know if people realize how many – there's probably two to three events Every day of the year, maybe except for Christmas and New Year, maybe Thanksgiving, that they could go and give a speech or get up and give their, quote, one-minute signature talk, That's right. or their two-minute signature talk, or their three-minute signature talk. And the more they do it, the better they're going to become. And, and yeah, and there's so many places that offer that between rotaries and chambers of commerce, and um, you know the the diff, there's so many different opportunities. And and look, the 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 professional salespeople that are out there that are that are actually listening to this podcast and that are actually looking for self improvement already know about them. And so for them, it's really just hone in on your message and and uh, create some value in there. And so I want to go to there to that create value because. That's something that you just said there. So a couple, couple notes for everybody of what, what Kelly just said here is that um, he finds, and Kelly, you find places that are credible sources to some extent, right? Because we know that social media isn't always credible, um, but people trust their Instagram reels or their feed, right? They, they see what's going on in there. And if you're coming up in there, they're going, well, who is this guy? Is he an influencer? Is he, is he somebody I should be paying attention to? Let me listen to this reel. And what I'm getting at here is that once they listen, if they don't hear value, they're tuning you out. And so I'm, right. I'm interested in, in, in you bringing that up earlier in that you try to create as much value as possible. And I'm interested in your philosophy on that, on how you create value. So, so earlier this year, I like to talk about living life on purpose and with purpose, right? Mm. So... Um, we rented out all of our homes. We had no place to live, so we went to Mexico for a couple months and Panama for a month, right? So we're traveling. By the way, if you go to Panama and Mexico, um, you better verify they have a really good internet connection because they don't. They don't. <laughs> so you better make sure that they do. Uh, we, we had some challenges, but it, it was fun. The good news is there's a Starbucks everywhere, and they always have good internet. That's good to um, know. Thank you. Thank God for Starbucks, I got to tell you. Um, oh, God, what was I saying? Yeah, we, you, you were just telling So scenario. yeah, so you were just telling us about creating value, and you were going to share a story about going to Mexico and Panama. Yeah. So my wife and I would be driving around exploring the countryside, and we had this little game we played every day. She would, she would give me a subject, and I would have to shoot a video. Like, when I'm driving the car, she would record me. Kelly, talk about this, talk about that. So I would try to do a one- to two-minute video where I would touch on a subject, right, and try to give people everything they need to know about that subject that they could take and utilize immediately without asking for anything. Mm. Okay. So, you know, that might be something like goal setting. Hey, man, let me tell you about goal setting. Goal setting is the most overrated, ridiculous thing 
Forget about goal setting. It doesn't work. But you know what does work? Set a goal, but you got to take action. Take action. You can set a goal all day long. It's just a dream unless you take the first step. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. How do you climb a mountain? One step at a time. If you want to achieve something, yes, set a goal. But set a doggone action plan and do it right now. Don't wait. Do it now. Then I'd stop. And that would be the video, right? And I think as salespeople, if you've made the greatest sale, then I think you just need to share that message. So I told you about the dream I had, right, where I, I had the dream and God said, Kelly. So I realized that wasn't a dream, man. Dude, that was like God talking to me. Like, dude, you were put on this earth for a bigger purpose. Selling annuities and making money is not your freaking purpose. Get off your ass and do something. So I enrolled in a course on how to become a I had made a living for 30 years speaking on stage. But, you know, I didn't know how to sell from the stage. Right? Mm. I can get people motivated. I didn't put money in my pocket. Mm. I could help turn somebody into a $600,000 year salesperson. Didn't necessarily put money in my pocket. But if I wanted to do my calling in life, which is like, I will talk to somebody about sales for hours. I'll meet somebody at a bar and then... If I find out they're in sales, I start sharing information. Why? It's what I love. Um, if there's a true calling in my life, that's what it is. So I had to I had to hone my skills. So I took a very expensive public speaking course. I took another one two years ago. I took another one this year. I'm forever reading sales books. It's not like I'm not already really good, but you know what? I'm thinking Michael Jordan was the first one in the gym every morning. He was the last one out every night. He was out playing basketball when he could have been streaming some stupid TV show on Netflix. But, you know, you, you take a look at anybody who's at the highest level of their game, right? Whatever their game is, whether it's sports or politics, whatever. They're in, they're in 100%, and they're always trying to perfect their craft because there is no such thing as perfection. We can always get better. So you were talking about Gitmer. I looked, he has about three books out, I think, right now. I, I, you know, uh, Little Red Book of Selling is one, and then there's, there's another one. Um, there's, there's some really big trainers out there. Jeremy Miner, there's Daniel Pink, there's Grant Cardone. I mean, look, they all have something... Right, so I'm studying them all the time. Mm. My wife goes, "What are you reading? A book on sales?" Mm -hmm. She goes, "Really? Oh, how unique!" It's like you know, it's either sales or or it's about people and communication because that's all sales is. So if I'm not working all the time, at not only I just and first off, I believe I've got to study a couple hours a week just to maintain a good level. If I want to get better, I got to. I got to work harder. I got to work smarter. Um, I'm using things like books, audio. I'm doing a lot of streaming now. I'm watching speakers like um, TD Jakes. Uh, there's a guy named Miles Monroe. Um, you know, these, these guys are the kind of, you know, Southern speakers like you would see at a revival, right? I, I love those kind of speakers because they're motivating. I, I love the energy they bring. And um, I'm actually in a national speak-off here in Miami in uh, December. I've made it through 2,000 people. I'm in the top 100 right now. Um, and my goal is to win. So every day I'm practicing my one-minute, two-minute, three-minute speech, trying to make it motivational, trying to make it inspirational. Most importantly, I'm not asking for anything. I am giving value. I am telling stories. I am like and – and I even say – so. I, I, I was in, I don't know, I was in front of 50 people here two weeks ago in Dallas. And I said, hey, you may not remember me, you may not remember my name, but I'm going to give you a gift, and I hope you remember this. And I said, I want you to think about the richest places on earth. Where are they? They are not the gold mines of South Africa or the diamond mines of Johannesburg. They're not the oil wells of the Middle East. 
It is not the gold-lined streets of Silicon Valley or Wall Street. The richest places on earth are also the saddest. It's our cemeteries. Number one best-selling books were never written. Number one best-selling singles were never composed. Billion-dollar companies were never started. Don't let your dreams, don't let your desires, your aspirations go to the grave with you. Mm. Take action. Start to live your dream. Design a life on purpose, with purpose. Mm. Drop the mic. I was done. Got a standing ovation. So I'm working every day, like literally every day, at perfecting my craft, knowing that like somebody asked, how was that speech? You go, it was about an eight and a half. I could have been better. I might have yelled too much at the end. I probably could have done this. And they go, okay, yeah. I think most people in the room probably thought it was a 10, but you're right. It was probably an eight and a half. And I work every day to make it a nine. I almost never get there. Because even when I get better, I know it could be better. Then I see somebody like T.D. Jakes or Miles Monroe or Pedro Adeo speak, and I'm going, hey, I got to get my game to a new level. And I'm going to go head-to-head with 100 of the top speakers in the U.S. And it's like, maybe it's showtime. I'm not afraid of competition. And if I fail, I fail. But I'm going to give it everything I got. I'm not going to sit back and, and look at that experience and go, I wish I would have done a little bit more homework. No, it's like, man, that guy beat me. Or that gal beat me. Hands down. They did a great job. Could I have maybe one? Yeah. But, you know. Next time. I don't think there's going to be a next time. I, and I intend on winning that damn competition. But again, you know, it's like I talk to so many people and they go, oh, yeah, I know that. Oh, yeah, I've read that book. Oh, yeah, I've done this. I've done that. It's like, then why aren't you where you want to be? Mm-hmm. If well, Something prompted me this morning. It's like something that I say to myself virtually every day. When you're green, you grow. Or when you're ripe, you rot. I see so many people in life that are, that are ripe. They're just hanging around waiting. I don't know what they're waiting for. Waiting to die, maybe? I, I don't know. Me, I'm almost 70 freaking years old, dude. And I am still rocking and rolling. I am still trying to, like, accomplish things. Like, I want to get on this new endeavor. I want to, like, life is, there's a huge thing in front of me. And, like, okay, I could, in the next 10 to 20 years, I can accomplish this. Doesn't matter. I'm going to be 90. I think I can do that, right? It's, there's always something else for me to strive for and look forward to virtually every day. Mm. You know, I, I, I love, I love having a guest like you on where it's like, you, you take all of the work off of my plate. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's amazing. I, you know, um, t- typically I, I have people in studio and, um, and, uh, you know, and, and those podcasts go pretty long and you and I were talking about this in the pre-show uh, that those podcasts go pretty long, but I'm, I look over and I'm just like, man, we can go on another hour right now the way that he's going. Kelly, Kelly is rocking it. Um, I am I am interested in so many of the different things that you said there, but I want to break some of it down a little bit um, in okay. order to help our audience. So um, I'm going to ask you the first question that comes to mind based off of what you just shared there, and it has to do with with the speaking part of it. So we're going to kind of just shift gears a little bit from sales and into the speaking part of it because you're talking about this speaking conference um, that you're a part of, 100 speakers, top, top ones, and there's a couple things in there that I kind of want to, that you mentioned, that I want to isolate and and speak a little bit about. One of them is is that idea that you've put in, that vision that you've put in your mind of, I'm going to win it. This is the last one. I'm going to win it. One, I love that. That's that's the winner's mentality. Um, the other thing, you kind of gave us a little a little preview or, or, or feel or a little of, of the speech that you gave. I'm interested in the speech writing process for you and, and what that looks like. Yeah, so let me cover one thing. Um, when you, you talked about me seeing the outcome of me winning, right? Yeah. It's the same thing in sales. I used to go door to door selling annuity products. And I would, and I learned this from Tony Robbins, maybe, I don't know, 30 years ago, but I would get to the house. I would get my energy level up. I'd clap my hands. But what I would see is I'd see myself coming out of that door two hours from now, shaking that customer's hand and saying, congratulations. Never thank you, by the way. It's congratulations. Because they made the right decision. You facilitated it. Hmm. So 
I always have a vision of the outcome always in my mind. It's like I have that. My, my speech writing process is you, you want to tell a story that's heartfelt, that hopefully when you're done with the story, people go, oh, crap, I want to know more, right? You want to deliver some content in there. And so um, my... You know I'm a really good salesperson if you actually saw and met my wife, <laughs> which I have to keep selling every day, by the way. Um, she is petrified, petrified to be on stage, petrified. Even though she's a great salesperson, one of the top realtors in the country, I convinced her to enter the same contest with me. She did not make it through the first, the first city, but I had her go again. And she didn't make. She made it through the first round of Dallas, but she didn't make it to the second round. So I said, "Go again, and just let's keep fine tuning your story, not my story. I can write you a great speech, but it's got to be your story." And so we developed a speech called "From Barista to Millionaire," right? From Barista to Millionaire, and that's what she is now. And um, she won. She got a gold ticket. Hold on, hold on. I'll show you. Your audience can't see this. So the, the the audience can't see it, but I want to describe Kelly real quick. The, Kelly's got his his black shirt on. He's got a beautiful uh, abstract painting in the background, and your your mustache. People are going to have to go on Instagram and check you out. Um, and now he's showing me show me the gold ticket again. Let me see this. Um, so we got we got the gold ticket from the Great American Speak Off, and that is your wife who won that ticket. Is that right? Yeah, this is actually mine. I won this the week before in Dallas. She went uh, last oh, weekend to Atlanta, and she made it through and got really good response. So we're both in the top 100 out of about 2,500 people that showed up for auditions. So. Very, very cool. And, you know, so let's tie that back to sales, right? Because um, sales, uh, communication, storytelling um, is all tied back to sales. So when we're talking about your pitch, as anybody who's out there and listening as, as a salesperson or, a, like we said, entrepreneur or business person, it's your story, right? And it can't be somebody else's. Right. It can't be somebody else's. Yeah. And I'm glad you said storytelling. Um, one thing I learned years ago, and this is probably the very, very first sales, very first sales job was J.C. Penney selling shoes. <laughs> <laughs> is there a J.C. Penney's anymore? Um and then my next one was a little boutique uh, store, and and there was this old guy who was my kind of manager trainer, but funny. Dude was freaking hilarious, right? And he shared something with me. He goes, "Hey, listen, man. You know, in sales, you can sell or you can make people have fun, and if they're having fun, they're going to be much more likely to buy one, two, maybe even three pair of shoes." Um, and he, and he taught me something else. He, he said, he didn't actually say it this way. He goes, sell them what they want, but give them what they need. Now, back in the old days, women would come in and say, I'm a five and a half, but I'm looking down at those shoes and I'm going, oh, girl, you ain't no five and a half. Like, that's a solid eight, right? So I would go get a five pair. I would measure a feet, say, okay, yeah, you're right. Hey, I got this pair of shoes that you're going to love. Now, they fit a little small. So a five would fit you probably more like a three or something. But I, I got a pair that I think will fit you perfect. Put those on. I didn't tell her it was an eight, right? I told her it was a pair of shoes that will fit perfectly. She would look good in and be able to walk all day without having any foot pain. Ooh, what size is this? That doesn't matter. I mean, I think it's labeled an eight, but it really is more like a five and a half, right? I sold her what she wanted, a five and a half, but I gave her what she needed, an eight. Mm. Um, but I learned storytelling. So whenever I'm trying to tie a point in for somebody, it's either a story or I'm trying to get them to envision an image in their mind of them enjoying the benefits of whatever I'm proposing to them at that time down the road, mm. you know, and it might be, Hey John, you know, I don't know if this will actually work for you in your career, but let's just suppose for a minute that it did. And you actually got the results that most of our clients do. 
anywhere from 30 to 70 percent increase in sales over the next 90 days. What would that actually mean for you personally and maybe for your business? Mm. And then you set up and wait for them to answer. Yeah. Right? So I think storytelling is also asking the right questions where you have people think about already owning the product and whether it's going to work or not work for them. Um, yeah, I, I, we've all heard the expression, right? God gave us one mouth, two ears. The problem is we really use this twice as much as our ears, and because we're always trying to think about what we're trying to say and do instead of taking the time up front. When, when I first started selling financial services door-to-door, I had a mentor. Um, and I, I, I said, look, I want to go out with you for one week. One week, I'm just going to be on your hip. I just want to watch you and listen to you for one week. And I actually recorded it a couple of times. One day I'm in my office on a Saturday practicing. So I'm on a Saturday morning. I'm in my office in my house. My wife just comes out and says, when did you start stuttering? I go, I don't stutter. Goes, oh, yeah, you do. I go, uh, no, I don't. You were just stuttering. I go, I was not. Listen to the damn tape. Like, kind of like that commercial that's on TV right now, Progressive or whatever. So I listened to the tape, and sure enough, I was stuttering. And I, oh, that's where Paul stutters every time that he's given a sales presentation. She goes, you're kidding me. I go, no. So I actually do the same thing. Now, she goes, why? I go, he's my mentor. It works for him. I'm, I'm modeling him maybe a little too much, but I got that script down so tight that I actually stuttered just like he did. It's not on purpose, by the way. Right. It's just from internalizing it, right? Now, I had to actually learn to overcome that problem later on because I found out I was doing it all the time, and it took me about six months to unlearn that stutter part. But I still had a little bit of it because I internalized it so much in my first 30 days on the job, I couldn't get rid of it. But but that's what happens. I mean, I watch speakers uh, very often, too, and I find uh, speakers today will say, uh, now, of course, I'm drawing a blank on what they, they normally say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of, of course I am. Uh, but I think, I think the word right comes up a lot. I think a lot of speakers will say, uh, right? And, and, and then I start saying that or they, the, the, the hand gesture of using kind of like that one inch hand gesture is, is used very yeah. often where you're, you're taking your thumb and maybe your middle finger, or your index finger, and you're creating like an inch of space. And, and that's another thing that we model as speakers. We, we do model uh, the speaker in front of us because what you just said, because it works. It is important to take some of that modeling and, and turn it into your own. And, and that's really what's going to work because when you're selling, you're selling yourself. And it's like you said, Kelly, it's like you're transferring the energy that you have within and you're transferring that to the client and, and helping them. Um, I want to just uh, dive a little deeper into your Tony Robbins experience. And, and you brought up another classic with a Dr. Wayne Dyer. And uh, I'd be remiss yes. if I didn't ask about that because I have to tell you, um, Tony Robbins and Dr. Wayne Dyer, uh, Tony Robbins is still with us, Dr. Dr. Wayne Dyer is no longer, um, but they're two of the most influential people in my life in that um, when I first started with self-development, they were essentially my air quotes, Dale Carnegie's. They were the people I yeah. turned to and listened to and kind of helped me understand, I, I'm going to isolate the two in terms of Tony Robbins really getting me into a place where um, building that self-confidence and um, that, that seller's mentality of, of understanding um, what I'm doing and, and speaking and all that other stuff. And then Dr. Wayne Dyer bringing in that spiritual element of regardless of religion, right? Just bringing in, there, there was the right, by the way. There was it. There it was. Um, bringing in that 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 spiritual element and that meditative element and being one with with yourself and the I am statements and how strong and powerful those are. When you say I am confident, I am a leader, I am a good salesperson. Speak to us a little bit about your relationship there with them. Yeah, let's talk with about Wayne Dyer first. Sure. Um, was Dr. Dyer was. Uh, you're probably too young to remember, but there were these things in the old days called cassette tapes. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> you can put him in a car and actually play music, but that's how a lot of us salespeople or self-development started. Yeah. Well, we would it. plug those into our car, right? Yeah. Um, so I bought uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer's, I don't know if it was his very first tape series, but The Psychology of Winning, hmm. right? And um, I probably I still have it, by the way. It's all warped, and it's some gnarly-looking freaking tape series. Don't know if the tape still worked. It might have dried out by now, but I still have it. Um, but between Doctor, between Doctor Wayne Dyer and, and uh, Wayne Dyer and uh, Dennis Waitley, mm-hmm. from Wayne Dyer, I learned that everything in life that happens to me is because of me. Mm-hmm. If somebody runs a red light, I can avoid that. If I'd have been slowing down and looking both directions, if there's always a way. So I learned that never regret anything, never look back, take total responsibility for everything. So I, I try, try never to put the blame on anything else. I mean, I find myself every once in a while, then I, I realize it's really all about me. Um, Dennis Waitley, the psychology of winning made a, a big difference to me. And I think Dr. Dyer's book, um, the blue cover with his face on it. I, I can't think of the name of the book. I went through that book and the tape series, I don't know, half a dozen times, and it really made me realize that I can do whatever I need to do, want to do, as long as I can kind of see it and envision it and put some sort of plan together that I can accomplish it. Tony Robbins actually came about because my boss at that time had offered a bunch of people to go to Tony Robbins, and I think everybody said no. And, and, I, and I went, Dude, why, why didn't you invite me? He goes, well, I didn't think you needed it because you're already the number one salesman, like, in the freaking country. I go, well, how do you think I get there? Right. Like, this is I, food for I us. I don't really know about Tony, but I want to go, right? So I went to my very first Tony Robbins event. That's in the old days when the, you walked on the fire, the UPW. Sure. And that fire pit was long, dude. Like, it was long. Now it's really short. Um, but I... I think once you can do, first off, if nobody's ever been to a Tony event, they're like 18 hours long. Mm. And there's no potty break. And there's no dinner break. I mean, I swear it is like a marathon in self-endurance, right? But it's a fun, exciting, he uses multimedia, you know, you're mm-hmm. exhausted, but it gets you up. And, and I realized that, dude, if I could walk on fire, I could do anything. Like, there's... Like anything it doesn't really matter. It's funny as in 2010, I actually Tony was doing one of his very first um, business masteries in Melbourne, Australia, and I had a business idea in my mind. And this sounds stupid and weird, but honest to God, it's true. I said, I'm going to buy a two thousand dollar ticket to fly to Australia. I'm going to stay at the hotel the events at, which is like I don't know, two hundred fifty bucks a night. And by the way, Australia's expensive, dude. Like, a hamburger is like 18 to 20 bucks. Just a hamburger. So I go, I'm going to go there, and I'm going to meet Tony. I'm going to give him my business idea, and he's going to love it. And guess what happened? I met Tony. I gave him my business idea. In fact, I was at another event. He gave me VIP tickets, and I, I was with Oprah, actually, at the time. Not with Oprah. I was in her section right next to her. I, I can actually say I had Oprah's toes in my nose when we were laying on the floor meditating at a Tony Robbins event. Wow. But he came up to me in front of 10,000 people and goes, dude, I've been calling you for weeks. How come you haven't answered my call? And I'm like, dude, if you'd have called me, I would have answered. You must have the wrong phone number. But um, I gave him a business idea for what is now one of his companies called OsteoStrong. That was actually my idea. Um, I had no way to monetize that, unfortunately, or, or to do it. But I did sell Tony five of the machines, one for his Palm Springs home, one for his home in Vancouver, his in-laws, and then a couple for some of the one for his uh, resort in Fiji. And then uh, when he, we moved to his new house in Florida, he sent me a picture from his grassy lawn on his lawn chair with his feet sticking up over the ocean. He goes, dude, this is my view. What do you think? Jelly. <laughs> But, so do you have yeah, a friendship so, with him? Uh, you have an open communication with him still? or? Yes. So um, 
I wouldn't say, you know, I would say we're we're not close friends. We're I have his direct phone number, so you communicate, um, and I do text him every once in a while. Like I don't, most people don't know his birthday is uh, February 29th, so he only has a birthday once every four years. But I always text him like on the 28th, hey, happy birthday tomorrow. If there was a 29th, right, right. So that kind of stuff, and him and Sage always text back, you know, whatever. But well, you know, my um, audience is saying now you got to help me get Tony on this show now, right? <laughs> so let me. So I called Tony two years ago, and I go, "Hey, dude, I got four, two friends that are really high up with the XP. They're the biggest producers in the XP, and um, we were talking about your event. I go, would you mind copying me a couple of VIP tickets for them so they could bring, you know, their wives? And he goes, oh, dude, no problem. Um, why don't you come? You and your wife come, too. I'll give you guys VIP, blah, 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 blah. So I introduced Brent and his partner, James, to Tony. They have now hired Tony twice to speak at their events. And so, and Tony just now did a big thing for EXP where all the big EXP producers got to go to his event for, like, nothing. Um so I feel really good that I helped start that, even though again I didn't monetize that. But you don't you don't make you don't monetize friends and relationships no. like that. But you it, but you know, like, it, you know, go ahead. You, you just do it because it's the right thing to do. And I think that look, I don't care if it's Tony Robbins, Grant Cardone, um, you know, Pedro Adeo. Hey, if it's the right thing to do, you got to expose people to those people because they have great messages and great content. You may not like the messengers or the way they deliver them, but they have great content. Um, you know, like I was studying Grant Cardone earlier this year when I was in Mexico. My wife goes, oh, my God, you're starting to sound like him. You're saying the word literary now, not literally. I go, literary. Yes, yes. That's how Grant says literary. That's right. That's right. And it's funny. Uh, you know, I, I never thought I could, we could, I could find another speaker uh, through social media, of course, that, that's more high energy than Tony Robbins, but Grant Cardone is, is right up there with him. Um, oh my God. What I wanted to say before um, uh, was, but what you did is like you show, again, we talked earlier about planting that seed and what comes around goes around with that one client that you worked with. And I mean, there you are, you know, Tony plants, you know, you, 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 you say, hey, can, can you comp us a few tickets? He says, sure. Next thing you know, Tony's getting hired to go do these conferences and, 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 you know, he's a, he's a highly paid speaker, so they're paying him big money. So, and, and that wasn't the expectation either. And I think it's so important and you being the orchestrator in all of that, like you said, you, you didn't get anything out of it. You didn't monetize, but I'd argue that you did get a ton out of it. I mean, you got to imagine, and, and this is so important because being a connector in sales is also something that's overlooked is that, you know, we talked about prospecting, we talked about sales process, but how about being a connector, right? How about being that middle person that puts two people together? Think of that value. And, and I would love for you to expand on that, Kelly, that value that now you are in those two people's eyes, they're connecting, they're selling their products back and forth, but you're the glue. Yeah, you know, um, I I get a lot of satisfaction knowing that I've given a lot of people ideas, um, and they and they've taken those. Now, you know, I, I believe in doing, you know, quote, we'll call them personality profiles, right? Like mm -hmm. I know I'm a ten quick start in the Colby system, which I'm a great idea guy. I'm never going to finish anything, right? <laughs> I can get you motivated. I can like, here's my idea. <laughs> give it to somebody. Do a workbook for me, please. Leave these things blank so I can have my, you know, students, clients fill in the blank. But I, I, I love being able to get an idea, sharing it with somebody, and then see them reap the benefits. Now, there may be no financial benefit to me. At least that's maybe visible up front, right? But I think it just makes you feel good at the end of the day that you're doing the right thing, right? Um, and I think a lot of salespeople sometimes all we, we look at our success on a dollar scale or on a scale of units of production where it's really a lot more than that. And I think that when you can sit down with somebody, as long as you're giving them value and they get some great benefit from it, I, I remember my wife and I were at the Trump Resort in Miami I don't know, two years ago in January. We were at some conference, and a guy came up to me, and he goes, hey, dude, you don't know who I am, but I saw you speak eight years ago. I'm like, 
you remember me from eight years ago? I had hair then. <laughs> and he goes, I still remember your story about, and he told me three stories that I shared from on stage, right? And this was at a financial conference in Nashville, Tennessee. I don't think, if you say Nashville, I don't think you actually have to say Tennessee, but anyway, I did. Um, in Nashville. And he was going, dude, that took me from being, I don't know, maybe a hundred thousand dollar a year producer to like, I'm making mid six figures right now. I'm working three to four days a week. I take two months a year off to travel with my wife and kids and enjoy my life. And he goes, I got almost all of that from your 45 minute presentation on stage hmm. about how to design the perfect financial services company where you can actually not only make money, serve people and enjoy life. Right. And I got such a huge kick. First off, I was just amazed somebody could remember me from eight years before. Um, but it was, it, I just love hearing those stories of success, right? It's like, Oh, I kind of impacted. And a lot of people don't realize like how many people we impact on a day to day basis. I remember sitting one time, um, I don't just, just thought popped into my head and I freaked out. I had like, uh, I think eight employees. And then I realized all those employees had a spouse and then all those employees had kids. And I counted up, I was responsible for 54 people, <laughs> which kind of freaked me out. Right. Cause it's like, Oh my God, if I don't do my job, I'm impacting 54 other people's lives, including my wife, my kids, you know, and then I started realizing, and then, I, then after a few days of freaking out about that and kind of being distraught, I went, wow, well, wait a minute. I'm actually impacting 54 people's lives in a positive manner, right? They're able to live in nicer places, go to nicer schools, right? And it's all because, well, not all because, but part of it is because of the fact that I've spent the time to develop some sales skills that I can utilize to help build a business even though my number of employees isn't huge, but their reach is, is huge, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't think a lot of us realize how many people we connect with on a day-to-day -day basis that we have an opportunity to change so many people's lives just by sharing our story, doing what we know we love to do, right? Um, so who knows what me introducing Tony Robbins to Brent Gove and his business partner, Jim. But the bottom line is I was just watching some videos from Tony's event with all these people from EXP. And I went, wow, you know, right now there's probably a thousand people that are being impacted because of my relationship with Tony and introducing him to Brent from two and a half years ago in Dallas. We, we flew to Dallas for that workshop, but, Dallas well, Convention Center, one. That that ties into one of your missions, but I'm I'm not going to go there. I'm I'm actually I'm interested in in your mantra here that I'm going to share with everybody. But I will just share with everybody one of your missions, which I think is is incredible because it speaks to the value of service. It speaks to what you just said here, and it kind of like puts a really fine point on it. In that you you wrote to me that your mission is to help a thousand people become millionaires in the next eight years, um, and it sounds like. Uh, and, and you said for all the right reasons, of course, and and it just sounds like you're you're on your way to that mission. It sounds like you 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 might have even accomplished it. You might not even know it, but it, yeah, I see it. Yeah, you you probably have you. <laughs> I don't know. I see the smirk. Yeah. No, not you don't know yet. I, it it is funny. Um, over the years, there are people that I've actually trained that have achieved much greater. And by the way, you know you've done a really good job when your students become much more successful than you. <laughs> you know it. You feel a little like, damn, that should have been me, but, you know, you feel really good. And so, yes, um, I've, I've helped many people already. That's um, fantastic. Our, our mission right now is to really go out and, and try to, to – and look, life is not about money, right. right? I mean, look, you can have all the money in the world be the most – look at all these people that are rich and famous that are committing suicide, mm -hmm. right? But somebody didn't tell me a long time ago, if you don't – like – We've all heard, and I, I, I'm going to share this, by the way, in my speech in, in uh, Miami. So it was a sneak preview for all of you out there. There we go. Um, money is the, what are the next four words? Most people will say root of all evil. Right. That's the wrong mindset in regards to money, honey. Mm -hmm. Money is the solution to most problems. Mm -hmm. See, if you have enough money, you can provide a better living environment for your family. You can donate to charities or your church to help things happen. 
you can give money to somebody like a homeless person who's on the street for whatever reason. They're not bad people. They're just in a bad situation. But money, you can get better care. You can take better care of yourself. You can eat healthier foods. You can get better education. Is it going to solve all your problems? No. But with money, it does give you more options, which gives you more freedom to do the things that you want and or need to do. Yeah. So it's, you know, I, I, when, we, when I came up with that idea to help, you know, a thousand people become millionaires, it, it wasn't just to become a millionaire. It's if I can help a thousand people become relatively independently, I don't want to say independently wealthy. I don't know that a million dollars would do that today, but it, which could impact thousands of people's lives. Right. Because right. every day we, we come in contact with people and I carry cash around all the time, like all the time. I don't use it. I give it away. Hmm? I see somebody homeless. I'll pull over on the street corner, give them five, ten, twenty dollars if need be. Just, you know, whatever I got my wallet. I don't know what they're going to do with it. I know it makes me feel better. I hope they're going to go buy food. And I hope they just say, hey, at least somebody cares enough to give me a little bit of money. Um, I live in downtown Phoenix, so there's, pe- there's homeless people everywhere. You know, some of them have a lot of mental issues. Um, but they don't harass you. They don't bug you. They're not murderers. They're not rapists. They're not pedophiles. They're just people that just ended up, made wrong decisions, maybe, wrong place at the wrong time. Well, also but also self-medicated. Food, self-medicated yeah. through drugs and alcohol. Yeah, a lot of, I mean, there, there are people like having arguments with themselves, like, like oh, that guy's off his meds, right? But to be able to give back um, means a lot to me. You know, I have, I can afford it, so I don't mind doing it. It doesn't bother me. Um, I, and again, when it, when it comes to helping a thousand people, because if, if I think, if I can affect a thousand people, and those thousand people can affect a thousand people, that's a million people. And if they can affect a thousand people, that's a billion people. Mm. So, you know, is there a possibility that I could affect the lives of a billion people over the next 20 years? Yes. Mm. That's powerful. A lot of power in that. And um, I'll put everybody on to there's an Earl Nightingale YouTube video about that, about the uh, understanding what you just said there, and he, and he talks about that. You know, money is is the the roof over your, in your home. It's the you know, it's 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 getting your kids through school. It's the food on the table, and so understanding the benefits. And and we're not, you know, we're we're talking about sales here, and we're talking about becoming profitable and wealthy. So I think everybody can understand that. Uh, I'm gonna move on to your mantra here and uh, ask you about the horse race. I'm, I'm teeing you up for oh, the, horse the horse race. race. Yeah. Oh I know it was a while be- when you submitted this, but that's all right. I think you know it. The 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 three horses that ran the same 10 races. Yeah. So you know, this, this goes back, I think, to my Dale Carnegie days, dude. Um, so there was, a, there was a study done in the 50s, and I can't remember the name of the three horses. But one one horse of the year, and, and it was one of the first years that a horse actually won a million dollars in, in prize money. And there were two other horses that were basically in a lot of the same races. And the difference between first place, a million dollars, and third place, just under 100000 or right at 100000 number two was a little over $100,000 in prize money, which in the 50s is still huge, right? Sure. I mean, it's pretty it's huge big today. Money. Yeah. The difference between that was a half a head. Now, a horse has got a big ass head. Let's come on. I mean, they're they're big. Yeah. But if you take a half a horse's head, it's only about that much. Right. We're talking about like so 10, 10, 12 a inches. Dollars, pardon? We're talking about ten or twelve inches. Yeah. So the difference between a million dollars and a hundred grand is like twelve inches. It's like that much, right? Again, it's that thing you talked about. You know that one inch kind of with our fingers deal. That's right. Um, I remember the book from Good to Great or yep. Good to Great. Good to um, Great. And, and how good, and this is not in that book, I don't believe, but um, the, if you want to sit, call it the devil of success, is being good. Is being comfortable. Right? Mm. 
So a horse, each race is about a mile long or half a mile long, some are a quarter mile long. So I don't remember what the length of those races were, but I want to say it was close to four or five miles. The difference in those three horses running that four or five miles was 18 inches, hmm. right? From a million dollars to a hundred grand. You take a look at Olympic sprinters or marathon runners, like a 26.2 mile run and the guy who wins gets all the glory and the guy who comes in second who gets, who's that guy who came in second? Nobody knows. Unfortunately, nobody cares. Um, unless he's got one hell of a backstory. Mm-hmm. Um, is typically only in a 26 mile race, less than a minute. Mm-hmm. A lot of times it's less than 10 or 15 seconds over a almost three hour race for those, you know, high performing marathoners. And we, as salespeople, as entrepreneurs, as business owners, I don't think we realize what it takes to actually get to where we want to go. Tell your story. I, uh, when I was about 30, 33, 34, maybe 35, uh, we climbed Mount Rainier, Washington State, and we climbed the face that they practice on for climbing Mount Everest. So if you're climbing a mountain like that, you always get up about 3 in the morning and you start your ascent about 4, before, way before the sun comes up. Because you want to get up the mountain before it starts getting warm and the snow gets soft. That's when avalanches occur and a lot of weird things happen. So we didn't get up at 4 or 3. We, we got up at like 5 and started climbing at 6. And it's getting warm and you've got your gear on and you're climbing up this mountain. And all of a sudden, there's the ridge. You think you're at the top. And you get there. It's just another plateau. And then the mountain keeps going. And you climb that, you climb that, you're like 14,000 feet, you're sucking wind, you're dying, your legs are burning, you're, and you get to the next ridge, and it's just another like little plateau, and then the rest of the mountain. And I got to the point where I was like, I just don't think I can do this, man. I'm like, I, I, gotta, I gotta take a rest. Let me sit down. I sat in the snow, and I turned around, and I looked down the mountain, and I went, oh my God, look how far I've come. And as entrepreneurs and salespeople, I don't think we reward ourselves for the activity or how far we've come. What we do is we look at our end point where we want to go, the summit of Mount Rainier, and we're not there, so we're a freaking failure. But you know what? It's like I told my wife when she got on stage. Number one fear for most people in the U.S. is not dying. It's public speaking. It's not even a divorce. It's public speaking. You get on stage. You win. You're a winner, honey. You won. You got on the stage in front of 50 people, and you gave your speech, and they thought you were good enough to go to the next level. Next time, you didn't do so well. But you went back and flew across the country for a second time. And this time you did it. No matter what happens in Miami in a few months, maybe we go head-to-head. Maybe you beat me. I'm not going to let you, but maybe you do. Because maybe you connect better with the female audience. We'll see. But the bottom line is you're a winner right now because of your journey, not because of what you accomplished. Mm-hmm. You accomplished something. Nobody, like 2,500 people have tried to get to this level. You made it. And you've never spoken on stage in your life because you shared your story and people connected with it. And as salespeople, as entrepreneurs, as business owners, or want to be business owners, want to be entrepreneurs, it's like you've got to reward yourself, number one, for the activity, Mm. and then for little progress along the way. Like, I know a lot of people talk about setting BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals, which I believe in that. But you better have a game plan and have a lot of goals in between there so you can celebrate, reward yourself to give you the impetus to keep going. Because if all you do is keep putting this, this carrot out there that's so hard to reach, even if you get there someday, you're not going to feel fulfilled. So you've got to have many victories along the way. Mm. And uh, did I get off track again? There, no, Michael? no. That, that, I think that that's really great. I mean, what, what you're talking about, there, there's a couple of things that you're talking about here. And, uh, it, well, 
one one of the things that I'll unpack for everybody is that we're all so close to accomplishing our goals. And so often we give up on accomplishing that goal because the work to get close to it was so hard. Um, and then we're like, you know what, I'm going to throw in a towel. And meanwhile, your foot steps away, your hands throw away. And like you said, you're half a horse's head away from victory. And so what, what you're saying there too, and, and the second part of what you were saying there in your story that take a look back sometimes, take a look over that shoulder and say, you know what, look at how far I've come and give yourself the grace um, and, and understanding that you've actually come a long, long way. And when you reward yourself, I, I believe in your story that you were sharing about climbing that mountain is that that's like fuel. That is just fuel. And it fires you up to get up the mountain, to get to that next phase, to to get that extra sprint in your step, right? When you see those those track stars right. and all of a sudden the, the heat turns up right at the end there, and you're like, how the heck did Usain Bolt do that? And it's just like, well, because he's like, you know what? I believe in myself. I didn't put in all of that work, all of those months, all of the, those years to lose in the final lap here. And all of a sudden the burners turn on. And that's where it comes from. It comes from that and um and you've shown a lot of that passion you've you've shown a lot of that passion throughout all the years all your experience that you've shared with us in this podcast um I, i'm truly appreciative of the time that you've spent with us today and sharing all of your stories and i want to just give it back to you here in that um your final thoughts and words to our, our listeners here who are who are setting those big goals and 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 how you can add a little value to their life as we conclude yeah, if I was going to leave anybody with anything, um, I'll, I'll I'll go back to my graveyard story. Mm. Just start taking steps, baby steps. And I think if if you understand your big why, like why are you really doing this? Um, it'll give you the impetus to get up in the morning and to keep going forward. And when times get tough, you know, we've all heard the tough get going, but it's the people that understand their big why that they keep plugging away because they understand that there's a bigger purpose. Look, one thing I believe is, and whatever you believe in, I believe God put us here on purpose with a set of skills and the freedom to utilize those skills to make a difference, mm. right? I think if you can figure out your big why, get your voice, that will be the burners that you were talking about that will push you to that next level. And I always think like a thousand times a thousand is a million, and a million times a thousand is a billion. Think about the math is right there. Um, I just think of how many people I could impact over the next 10 to 20 years by, by helping entrepreneurs. Like one, thing I, look, one thing I know is everybody has to buy something from somebody. Business makes the world go round, right? And if you can instill the right virtues, the right traits, um, into people and help them become successful and they can help other people become successful. And whether it's selling somebody solar products or whatever, if there, you can impact so many people's lives that, but you got to figure out your big why. And I know my big why. Um, and I know what, what, you know, for years I was comfortable, dude. I made really high six figures. I had a really nice house. I had a kick-ass sports car that I rolled over. But I wasn't happy um, because I wasn't living what God put me on this planet for. Mm. And that was to help motivate, train people to get more success and to live a life that they designed before then or, or after then, I know that you put on a lot of events and um, uh, where people can sign up for. Could you share maybe, uh, and a lot of that will be in the speaker notes as well, um, share uh, the website and, and how people can join into those events? 
Yeah, by, so the way, as a, uh, by the way, as a little heads uh, up, I, by the way, as a little heads up, the reason why I know that is because I signed up for one of your events, so I'll be seeing you on the 30th. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so we do um, three- and five-day sales challenges where we, we just kind of go over all the principles of sales, a little bit of technique and questions and things like that. I think on the 30th, because of Thanksgiving, we're doing a three-day where, you know, if you give me an hour and a half a day for three days, uh, I'm going to give you all the tools that you need to take your sales game to a new level. And so that's coming up on the 30th. I uh, look forward to having you there. I love it. We have a lot of fun. We share a lot of information. Uh, and, again, uh, the, the good part about it is that it's free. Yeah, it's pretty um, cool. I'm I'm uh, I'm actually double booked that day because I'm doing my public speaking training that day. Um, I'm nice. doing the same thing. I'm doing a free free course, but I'm I'm excited to join into that training. I love yeah. I love those little three day sessions where you offer that free training. I think it's it's really great. You spoke about this earlier about selling from stage, and it's a really great way to be able to speak at a conference and offer something to everybody. So I'm I'm excited to join that training. And you do that often. Yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to get it set up now. We're going to do it every month now from awesome. this point forward. Um, because, like, we're going to go to Portugal for a few months here pretty soon. And the good news is Portugal has really good internet. There you go. And um, we're going to the southern part of Portugal on the Algarve area. And um, I will be able to do that from my laptop, in a, in a, you know, anywhere in the world. Um, awesome. Thank you, Tim Ferriss, for writing that book. That's right. Um so, hey, I really want to thank you, Michael. I really appreciate you having people like me on your podcast so we can share our vision, our dreams. And I want you to tell your dad, uh, you know, I know it's not set for five, but uh, thank you for his service. Um, and let him know that uh, have a great Veterans Day. Um, you know, I love hearing stories. It's funny how we have so many little coincidences. You know, it's, it's funny. It's just That's just the way the world is sometimes, right? What do they call it? The six degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon or something like that? Six degrees. That's that's for sure. So if if you want to catch up with Kelly, all of his contact information will be in the show notes. Um, you can find him uh, on social media, his website, and definitely, definitely, I highly encourage everybody to to join his mailing list and get into his his um, his live uh, training that he's going to be offering you. Right. These trainings, I'm going to tell you right now from my own personal experience. These free trainings, you get so much out of these. And based off of what Kelly just shared today is that it's it's leading with value. And the only thing you do after that then that Kelly can offer you is to be able to expand on that. So I want to thank you right. as well for coming on. I want to wish you a happy Veterans Day. To all of our veterans out there, happy Veterans Day. Even if you're not listening to this on Veterans Day, we thank every single one of you for your service. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for listening to The Michael Esposito Show. For show notes, video clips, and more episodes, go to michaelespositoinc.com backslash podcast. Thank you again to our sponsor, Den 10 Insurance Services, helping businesses get the right insurance for all their insurance needs. Visit den10.io to get a quote. That's D-E-N-T-E-N dot I-O. And remember, when you buy an insurance policy from Denton, you're giving back on a global scale. This episode was produced by Uncle Mike at the iHeart Studios in Poughkeepsie. Special thanks to Lara Rodrian for the opportunity and my team at Michael Esposito, Inc.